Disc 41, The Shepherd's Crown By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 11x16 A.C.H., Mistress, tis a heavy thing to be under a gee under a geese, Rob moaned. And Tiffany laughed. But Nightshade had questions for her. She had seen people coming to the farm during the day, coming for medicines, for advice, for an ear to listen and, sadly, sometimes for an eye to see the bruises. Why do you help these strangers? she asked Tiffany now. They are not of your clan. You owe them nothing. Well, said Tiffany, although they are strangers, I simply think of them as people. All of them. And you help other people that's how we do it. Does every person do it, said Nightshade. No, said Tiffany. Sadly, that is true. But many people will help other people, just because, well, because they are other people. That's how it goes. Do you elves not understand this? Shall we say that I am trying to learn, said Nightshade. And what do you find, said Tiffany, smiling. You become a kind of servant. Nightshade sniffed, her delicate nose wrinkling. Well, yes, said Tiffany. But it doesn't matter, because one day I might need that person, and then they will very probably help me. It works for us, it always has. But you have battles, said Nightshade. I know that. Yes, but not always. And we are getting better at the knot. You are powerful, though. You could rule the world, said Nightshade. Really, said Tiffany. Why should I want to do that? I am a witch, I like being a witch, and I like people too. For every nasty person, there's a nice one, mostly. There is a saying, what goes around comes around, and it means that sooner or later you will find yourself on top, at least for a while. And another time, the wheel turns and you will not be on top but you have to put up with it. She tried to look into Nightshade's eyes, see what the elf was thinking, but she might as well have looked at a wall. The elf's eyes were emotionless. And I remember the darkness and the rain and the thunder and lightning, she added, and what good has it done you? You, elf, found in a ditch. For once Nightshade seemed at a loss and looked carefully at Tiffany before saying, Your way. Would not work for elves. Every other elf is a challenge. We kill our queens every other queen is a rival, and we fight over the hive. She paused as a new thought struck her. Yet you have your queens of wisdom and thus there was Granny aching, and Granny Weatherwax, and yes indeed, Tiffany aching. You grow older, wisdom flourishes and is passed on. And you never prosper, you live in a cycle of decay, Tiffany said softly. And you are not bees. They are productive but they die young and never, ever have a thought. There was a strange look on the elf's face. She was having to think. Really think. Tiffany could see it. Nightshade had the face of someone who had already begun to think about a world that had changed, a world with iron that was less welcoming for the fairy folk, a world that liked them well enough in stories but had no real belief in them, gave them no way in, now she was looking closer and she was finding a new world she had never thought about before and she was trying to reconcile it with everything else she knew. And Tiffany could see the battle in her face. Over in Lancray, Queen Magrat had heard about the trouble up in the Rem Tops the attack on the lumberjacks, the deaths and the lost timber. Elves, she thought. They'd seen them off last time, but it hadn't been easy, and it had been a long time since she'd posted guards well, Sean Og anyway up by the circle of stones known as the dancers, or made sure the castle had plenty of horseshoes to hand. She knew how the memory plays tricks, and the old stories had power, and everyone forgot how terrific really meant brings terror. Her people would only remember that the elves sang beautifully. 
they would have forgotten what their song was about. Magra was not only a queen, but also a witch, of course. And although she was mostly a queen these days, the witch part of her knew that the balance was off, that Granny Weatherwax had left a void behind her, and no matter how hard Tiffany Aching was working to fill it and that nice back houseboy she now had Granny Weatherwax was a hard act to follow, she had held the barrier, held it firm. And if the barrier was no longer strong. Magrat shivered. Anyone who had ever met Elvenkind knew that terror was absolutely the right response the only response. For the elves were a plague that could spread rapidly, destroying and harming and hurting and poisoning all they touched. She wanted no elves in Lancray. That evening, Queen Magrat went to her garderobe and took out her beloved broomstick, sat on it and very carefully tried a lift and, slightly against her expectations, it took off gently rising slowly over the castle. She flew around happily for some minutes and told herself, it's true once a witch, always a witch. Being a dutiful wife, when she wanted to be, she mentioned her intentions to her husband late that evening, and to her surprise King Varence said, back on the old broomstick, my love? Very glad to hear it. I've seen your face when a witch flies by and no man can keep a bird in chains. Magrat smiled and said, I don't feel like a bird in a cage, my dear, but now we don't have Granny, I feel I must help. Well done, said Varence. We are all coming to terms with what's happened, but I am sure Mistress Aching will follow in Granny's footsteps. It isn't like that, said Queen Magrat. I think she is walking in her own footsteps. She sighed. But there are elves afoot, she said. And I believe Tiffany will be at Granny's cottage no, her cottage later today, so I must go and see her, offer my support. Her husband shivered at the mention of elves. Of course, Magrat continued firmly, I also intend to be a good role model for our children. Young Esme is growing up fast and I want her to see that there's more to being a queen than waving hellos we don't want her to start kissing frogs, now, do we? We all know how that can turn out, fn2 she turned at the door, and tossed her husband a baby sling. I am quite sure, she said sweetly, that you can look after our children very well indeed on your own for a little while. Varence smiled weakly. Magrat made a face that only a witch would see. He holds them upside down sometimes, she thought to herself. He is a very clever man, but give him a baby and he doesn't really know what to do. She smiled. He could learn. And when she asked him to change a nappy, when Millie was off helping in the kitchen, he pulled a face but he did try anyway. I want to help, Magrat said firmly to Tiffany landing her broomstick outside what they both still thought of as Granny's cottage, less than an hour after Tiffany had arrived herself, the news quickly flashing up to the castle since Magrat had made it known she wanted to be informed. I am the queen, but I am also a pretty good witch. Tiffany looked into Magrat's eyes and saw her longing to be a witch once more, just for a little while, and then Magrat said, We have had elves here, Tiffany. Elves. And Tiffany remembered Granny Weatherwax telling her how Magrat had fought the elves before shot one right through the eye with a crossbow indeed. I have experience, Tiffany, Magrat continued. And you are going to need everyone you can get if the elves start coming through. She paused to think. Even novices. Have you spoken to Miss Tick? Yes, said Tiffany. She says she has found one or two likely girls, but not everyone can be a witch, even if they want to be. And at the moment it's not possible to take a girl on in my steading on the chalk. Why not? And what about your friend Pechalaya, her with the piggery? Well, she has the skills, said Tiffany, ignoring the first of Magrat's questions. But Pechalaya helps her husband to run the farm says she spends all her time among creatures who go grunt, 
and that sometimes includes the old pig farmers. And you have to admit that pig boring is good for everybody, even the pigs. It's terrible to hear the squealing if she's not there. Well, we may still need her up here, pigs or not. And heavy waterproof boots can take an arrow, said Magrat. So, any sign of elves down on the chalk? Tiffany colored, uncertain how Magrat would take her news about Nightshade, but thinking a little guiltily that at least it would save her having to tell Nanny Og herself. She told her about the beer first, then about Nightshade. How the elf was staying at her parents' farm, watched over by Fiegels. Making it impossible to take on any other help. Magrat knew the Fiegels would keep the elf from causing any trouble, but she was surprised by what Tiffany told her. Are you telling me you think you can trust an elf, she said. Her face had paled. No elf is trustworthy, she added. They wouldn't even know the meaning of the word. Yet you trust this elf? Why? No, said Tiffany. I don't trust her. But I think this elf wants to live. Nightshade has already seen for herself that our world is changing. The iron, you know. And now she has encountered ideas unknown to her. We might just be making some progress, and I think it's worth a try. Perhaps she might then go back to Fairyland and persuade other elves to think like her? To leave us alone? She paused. The Kelda of the Fiegels warned me, Magrat. She said that Granny's going would leave a hole. That we needed to take great care. It's the elves. It has to be. So if this elf can help, well, I must try. Hmm, but if those others do start coming, you're going to need help, Tiffany, said Magrat. She thought for a moment. I understand the Baron on the chalk has a wife who is a witch. Yes, said Tiffany. Letitia keepsake. But she's not trained and her husband is a bit how should I say it? Snobby. Magrat said, well, my dear, if you want. I'll fly down there and drop in for tea one day. And hint, in a subtle way, that the idea of being a witch for the people at large might be a good idea. My Varence, you know, likes to be thought of as a king of the people, and in fact, I feel sure he thinks I am being a good example to the population by working as a witch now. He talks like that, sometimes, but I love him nevertheless. The idea of this Letitia being friends with a queen might stop her husband interfering. Tiffany said, I am amazed. Just like that. Trust me, said Queen Magrat. Crowns are important, you know. Tiffany flew back to the chalk feeling a bit happier. Magrat would be a useful ally, and perhaps Letitia would be able to help too. But we are still short of witches so we must take pains to get more, she thought. Furious pains. That means pulling in every witch and likely witch to learn at least some of the craft and how to deal with the glamour of elves. Elves. Nastiness for the sake of being nasty. As Granny Aching had told her, they would take away the stick of a man with no legs. Nasty, unpleasant, stupid. Annoying trouble and discord just for the pleasure of it. Worse. They brought actual horror and terror and pain. And they laughed, which was bad enough because their laughter was actually musical and you could wonder why such wonderful music could come from such unpleasant creatures. They cared for nobody except themselves and possibly not even that. But Nightshade. Perhaps there was one elf for whom the wheel was turning especially the iron wheels. FN1 it had been in the good child's book of fairy tales and told how two little elves secretly helped a poor shoemaker, but sadly experience had taught Tiffany that a lot of what was in that book bore no relation whatsoever to the real fairyland. FN2 most princesses never tried to kiss toads, however, which had been a source of sadness to the Fiegel's toad lawyer for many years. 
Chapter 15 The God in the Barrow in the Dark of the Night, Down in the Chalk, the wheel was definitely stuck in the old ways just the way three elves dancing through the gloom of the woods liked it. This world was here for their pleasure, to entertain them, delight them. And the creatures within it were no more than toys, toys that sometimes squealed and ran and shrieked as the elves laughed and sang. Now they spotted a small home, a poor-looking dwelling with a window slightly ajar. From within came the sound of babies, gurgling happily in their sleep, their bellies full of their mother's milk, their limbs curled beneath the covers of their cots. The elves grinned at each other and licked their lips in anticipation. Babies. Faces now at the window. Predatory faces, with the eyes of hunters. Then a hand reached in and tickled the nearest infant under the chin, the little girl waking and gazing in delight at the glorious creature leaning over her, his glamour shining radiantly in the dark room. Her little fingers stretched to touch a beautiful feather. Tiffany's happiness lasted until just after she had gone to bed, when there was a sudden tickling in her head, and in her inner eye she saw young Tiffany Robinson the baby she had not had time to see yet this week the little girl on whom she had placed a tracking spell. But this was not just neglect by baby Tiffany's mum and dad. The elves had taken her. Tiffany's broomstick could not go fast enough. In a piece of woodland she found a group of three elves toying with the little girl, and what was inside her was not anger. It was something more forensic than that, and as the stick went onwards, Tiffany let her feelings flame up and release. The elves were laughing, but as Tiffany swooped down, she sent fire blazing from her fingertips and into them and watched them burn. She was shuddering with her fury, a fury so intense it was threatening to overcome her. If she met any more elves that night, they too would be dead. And she had to stop herself there, suddenly appalled at what she had done. Only a witch gone to the dark would kill. She screamed at herself inside her head. And another voice said, but they were just elves. And they were hurting the baby. The first voice came sneakily back with, but Nightshade is also just an elf. And Tiffany knew that if a witch started thinking of anyone as just anything, that would be the first step on a well-worn path that could lead to, oh, to poisoned apples, spinning wheels, and a too small stove. And to pain and terror, and horror and the darkness. But it was done. And a witch had to be practical, so Tiffany wrapped her shawl around the baby and slowly flew to the Robinson's house shack being, in fact, a better word for the little dwelling. Young Mr. Robinson opened the door to her knocking. He looked surprised, especially when Tiffany showed him his baby daughter, swaddled in her witch's shawl. She walked past him and confronted his wife, thinking, they are young, yes, but that doesn't mean you have to be stupid. Leaving the windows open at this time of year? Surely everybody knows about elves. My mother said I never should. Play with the fairies in the wood. Well, said Millie, I checked the boys. They seem to be all right. She blushed as Tiffany handed her the baby and Tiffany caught it. Let me tell you something, Millie. Your girl has a great future before her. I'm a witch, so I know it. Because you've let me name her, I will see to it that my namesake has what she needs in mind, it is your girl I am talking about. In some way, she's partly mine. Those great big boys of yours will look after themselves. Now don't leave your windows open on nights like this. There are always watchers. You know it. Let no harm attend her. Tiffany almost shouted the last bit. This family needed a little prod every so often, and she would see to it. Oh yes, she would. And if they neglected their duty, well, there would be a reckoning. Maybe just a little reckoning, to make them understand. But right now, as she headed home, she knew she needed to talk to another witch. She grabbed a warm cloak from her bedroom, 
then saw the gleam of the shepherd's crown on the shelf and, on a sudden impulse, tucked it into her pocket. Her fingers curled around the odd-shaped little stone, tracing its five ridges, and somehow she felt a strength flow into her, the hardness of the flint at its heart reminding her who she was. I need to keep a piece of the chalk with me, she realized. My land gives me strength, supports me. It reminds me who I am. I am not a killer. I am Tiffany Aching, witch of the chalk. And I need my land with me. She sped through the night sky, back to Lancray, the cool of the air rushing past, the eyes of the owls watching her in the moonlight. It was almost dawn when she arrived at Nanny Og's home. Nanny was already up, or rather she hadn't yet got down, since she had spent the night at a deathbed. She opened her door and blanched a little when she saw Tiffany's face. Elves, she asked grimly. Magrat told me, you know. You got trouble over in the chalk. Tiffany nodded, any calm deserting her as tears suddenly choked her voice. And over the requisite cup of tea in Nanny's warm kitchen, she told her what had happened. Then she came to the bit of the story which she struggled to get out. All she could say was, the elves. With little Tiffany. They were going to. She choked a little, then, I killed all three of them, she wailed. She looked despairingly at Nanny. Good, said Nanny. Well done. Don't trouble yourself, Tiff. If they was hood in that baby, well, what else could you do? You didn't. Enjoy it, she asked carefully, eyes shrewd in her wrinkled face. Of course not. Tiffany cried. But, Nanny, I just... I did it almost without thinking. Well, you might have to do it again soon if the elves keeps on common. Nanny said briskly. We're witches, Tiffany. We has the power for a reason. We just as to make sure as it's the right reason, and if there's an elf common through and hidden a baby, take it from me, that is the right reason. She paused. If n people do wrong things, well, why would they be surprised if bad things then happen to them? Most of em knows this, you know. I remember Asm telling me once, she was in some hamlet or other spickle, spackle, somewhere like that and people was trying to string up this man for killing two children and she said as he knew he deserved it, apparently he said, I did it in liquor and it ended in EMP. She sat wearily down, allowing Grebo to clamber onto her ample lap. Reality, Tiff, she added. Life and death. You knows it. She scratched the tomcat behind what might be described as an ear by someone with very poor eyesight. Is the child all right? Yes, I took her back to her parents but they... Can't. Won't. Look after her properly. Some folk just don't want to see the truth, even when you points it out to em. That's the trouble with elves, they will keep common back. Nanny sighed heavily. People tell stories about M, Tiff, she said. They make M sound fun it's as if their glamour hangs around after they've gone and stays in people's heads, telling M that elves is no problem. Just a bit of mischief. Nanny sank further into her chair, knocking a small family knick-knack off the table beside her. Feagles, she said. Their mischief. But elves? Elves is different. You remember how the cunning man crept into people's heads, Tiff? How he made people do things awful things. Tiffany nodded, her mind replaying horrible images while her eyes still focused on the knick-knack on the floor. A present from Quirm from one of her daughters-in-law, and Nanny hadn't even noticed she had knocked it over. Nanny who treasured every small object her family gave her. Who would never ever fail to notice if something was damaged. Well, that's nothing to what the elves might do, Tiff, Nanny continued. 
there is nothing they likes more than watchin pain and terror, nothing that makes em laugh more. And they love stealin babies. You did well to stop them this time. They will come again, though. Well, then they will have to die again, said Tiffany flatly. If you are there. Nanny said carefully. Tiffany slumped. But what else can we do? We can't be everywhere. Well, said Nanny, we've seen M off before. It was hard, for sure, but we can do it again. Can't that elf of yourn help? Nightshade. Tiffany said. They won't listen to her the way things are right now. They threw her out. Nanny pondered a bit, then appeared to come to a decision. There is someone they might listen to. Or at least they used to listen to I'm. If he can be persuaded to take an interest. She looked at Tiffany appraisingly. He don't like to be disturbed. Though I have visited him before, once, with a friend her eyes grew misty at the memorifn one and I think Granny and he may have had words in the past. He likes ladies, though. A pretty young thing like you might be just his cup of tea. Tiffany bristled. Nanny, you can't be suggesting Lordy, no. Nothing like that. Just a bit of. Persuadin. You are good at persuadin folks, ain't you, Tiff? I can do persuading, Tiffany said, relaxing a bit. Who do you mean and where do I go? The long man. Tiffany had heard a lot about the long man, the barrow that led to the home of the king of the elves mostly from Nanny Og, who had gone into the barrow and met the king once before, when the elves had been getting unruly. The professors would have said that the king lived in a long barrow from ancient times, when people didn't wear clothing and there weren't so many gods and in a way the king himself was a kind of god a god of life and death and, it seemed to Tiffany, of dirt and ragged clothing. And men still sometimes came to dance around by the barrow, horns on their heads and usually a strong drink in their hands. Unsurprisingly, they found it hard to persuade young women to go up there with them. There were three mounds to the barrow, Three very suggestive mounds that no country lass who had watched sheep and cows in action could fail to recognize there was always a lot of giggling from the girls training to be witches when they first flew over it and saw it from the air. Tiffany headed up the overgrown path, pushing her way through thorns and trees, untangling her witch's hat from a particularly insistent bush at one point, and stopped by the cave-like entrance. She was strangely reluctant to duck under the lintel past the scratched drawing of the man with horns and down the steps she knew she would find once she had pushed aside the stone at the entrance. I cannot face him just by myself, she thought with terror. I need someone who can at least tell people how I died. And a wee voice said, Crivens. Rob anybody. Oh I. We follow ye all the time, ye can. Yet are the hago the hills and the long man is a big hill. But, wait by the gate please, Rob, I must do this by myself, she said, suddenly filled with sureness that this was the right choice. She had killed the three elves, now she would face their king. This is hag business, ye can. But we knows the king, said Rob. If en we gee along wi yet. We can fight Jan Skunner in his an world. Oh I, added we dangerous spike. A big laddie, ye can, but I'll gi the bogle a face full of feagle he'll nay forget. He experimentally nutted one of the entrance stones, bouncing his head off the rock with a satisfying clunk. Tiffany sighed. That's what I'm afeard I mean, afraid of, she said. I want to ask the king for his help not anger him. And I know the Feagles have history with him. I, that's us, said Rob proudly. We is history. Nay king, nay quinn, nay laird, roared the assembled Feagles. Nay Feagles, said Tiffany firmly. A sudden burst of inspiration hit her. 
I need you just here, rob anybody, she told him. I have to do my hag business with the king without anyone disturbing me. She paused. And there are elves afoot. So if any should come seek in their king, I want you rob anybody, we dangerous spike, all of yet to stop them coming down after me. I need you to do this for me. It's important. Is that understood? There was a bit of grumbling, but Rob had brightened up. So we can GI them scunners a GUID kickin' if they shows up here, he asked. Yes, Tiffany said wearily. This was met by a cheer. N.A.C. Mac Fiegel, wah hat. She left them there, squabbling over who should guard which part of the long man, we dangerous Spike bashing his head enthusiastically against the entrance stones again as a sort of warm-up for what he hoped was coming, and she walked into the stinky darkness, clutching the small crowbar she had brought with her, along with a horseshoe. She put one hand into her pocket and held tight onto the shepherd's crown her ground, her turf. Let's see if I am truly the hag of the hills, she thought, and she gripped the big stone blocking the entrance. It rose up gently, no crowbar necessary, the stone crackling as she raised it higher and higher, revealing the steps beyond. The path inside led her deeper and darker, spiraling round and round, taking her into the heart of the barrow. Into a pathway between the worlds. Into the world of the elven king, where he floated between time and space in his land of pleasure. It was stifling though there was no fire the heat seemed to be coming out of the earth. And it stank. It reeked of masculinity and unwashed clothing, of feet and sweat. There were bottles everywhere, and at the end of the hall, naked men were wrestling, grunting and groaning as they twined and twisted with their opponents, their bodies greased as if from a bucket of lard. There were no women to be seen this was a land where men indulged themselves with no thought for the other sex. But when they saw Tiffany, they stopped and put their hands over their essentials as Nanny Og would have said and Tiffany thought. Ha, you big strong men, your meat and two veg hanging out, you are frightened, aren't you? I am the maiden and I am also the hag. She could see the king of the elven races. He was just as Nanny Og had described, still stinking of course, but somehow hugely attractive. She kept her eyes on the horns on his head, trying not to look at his meat and veg, which were huge. The king sighed, stretching out his legs and tapping his hooves against the wall, an animal scent like that of a badger in heat rising from him and curling towards her. You, young woman, he said lazily, his voice an invitation to romance, to wickedness, to pleasures you had not known you wanted until that moment. You come into my world. Into my entertainments. You are a witch, are you not? Indeed I am, said Tiffany, and I am here to ask the king of the elves to be a proper king. He moved closer and Tiffany tried not to blanch as the stench of him thickened. He smiled lasciviously, causing her to think, I know who you are and what you are, and I think Nanny Og must have liked you. Who are you? he queried. By your garb, you seem indeed to be a witch, but witches are old and somewhat wrinkled. You, girl. Sometimes, Tiffany thought, I am so fed up with being young. Fn2 my youth has got his attention, but what I need is his respect. I may be young, my lord, she said firmly, but as you see, I am a ha witch. And I come to tell you that I have killed three of your people. That should do it, she thought, but the king merely laughed. You interest me, my girl, he said, stretching languorously. I do no harm, he added lazily. I simply dream, but my people, oh dear, what can I do? I must allow them their delights, as I do myself. But their delights are not to our taste, said Tiffany. Not in my world. My world, chuckled the king. Oh, you have pride, little girl. 
Perhaps you would like to be one of my ladies. A queen needs pride. The Lady Nightshade is your queen, said Tiffany firmly, her legs shaking at the invitation in the king's words. To stay here? With him? Her mind shrieked. She gripped the shepherd's crown more firmly. I am Tiffany Aching, of the chalk, she said to herself, and I have flint in my soul. Nightshade is my guest, she added. Perhaps you did not know, my lord, that your queen has been thrown from fairyland by the Lord Peace Blossom. A lazy smile spread across the king's face. Nightshade. He mused. Well, I hope you enjoy her company. He spread his legs, making Tiffany gulp, and leaned forward. You begin to tire me now, girl. What do you want from me? Get your elves to see sense, said Tiffany. Or there will be a reckoning. Her voice almost wobbled on the last bit of this, but it had to be said, oh yes. There was a huge sigh, and the king yawned as he lay back again. You come to my abode and you threaten me, his voice caressed. Tell me, mistress, what care should I have for those elves who play in your lands? Even the Lady Nightshade? There are other worlds. There are always other worlds. Well, mine never was a place for elves, Tiffany said. It was never yours. You just latched onto it a parasite and took what you could. But once again I have to tell you these are the days of iron not just horseshoes, but iron and steel forged together in great lines across the land. It's called a railway, my lord, and it is spreading across the disc. People are interested in mechanical things, because mechanical things work, while old wives' tales mostly just don't kill them. And so people laugh at the fairies, and as they laugh, so you will dwindle. You see, nobody cares about you anymore. They have the clacks, the railways, and it's a new world. You and your kind have no future here now other than in stories. She said the last word contemptuously. Stories, the king mused. A way into the minds of your peoples, mistress. And I can wait. The stories will survive when this railway you speak of is long gone. But we will not stand by to see small children taken as playthings for elves anymore, Tiffany said. I and others will burn those who take them. Audiobook generated by Read with the ears.